Hello and welcome back. We'll be performing a thermal expansion experiment today here on the Matt Yasa channel. Before we can do our experiment, I'll have to create the apparatus. I'll begin heating my borosilicate tubing until it begins to glow, and then I can start to bend it into shape. And now a lot of glass workers actually prefer to attach a rubber hose to the end of the tube, which allows you to puff into it to keep the walls from collapsing as it loses pressure from thermal expansion. Thermal expansion happens to every material, the glass, the air, inside and out, and even the metal in the torch I'm using. As the molecules pick up the heat, the energy, it transfers it into a sort of kinetic vibration, kind of like a dance of molecules. And so with more heat, you get more molecular movement which makes the molecules space out farther, causing the object itself to grow in size. And now in physics, a lot of phenomena can be reversed if the circumstances go the other direction. So if a material expands as it gains heat, it therefore should contract as it loses heat. And that is what we'll be testing out here today. This smaller loop will be at the top of the apparatus and full of air, while the larger loop will be at the bottom and full of water. I'll use a capillary candle to apply a little bit of heat to the top loop, and we'll see if that causes the air to expand, pushing on the liquid in the bottom. It's actually very similar to a thermometer. However, we're not measuring the expansion of the liquid as a whole, but the expansion of the air, which is trapped behind the liquid. So we should see some pretty good results, as air has a very high rate of thermal expansion. It's good to note for my other glass working friends that when you put a vessel in the kiln at 1050 Fahrenheit, which is the normal annealing temperature for borosilicate, the air inside will expand to twice its volume. And so when you remove it from the kiln, the air density in the vessel will be half of what it was, or half of what it will be at room temperature. So as it cools down, it will actually suck in air. So learning about thermal expansion is pretty important for glass working, but it's important for other jobs as well. If you ever plan to pour a driveway or lay down a road, thermal expansion is going to have to be taken into account. During the hot and cold days, the concrete is constantly expanding and contracting and eventually will crack. And so before it can dry, you have to lay some expansion joints. Just some empty gaps for the concrete to expand into and contract out from. If you keep your eye out, I'm sure you'll not only see this in the roads and driveways, but bridges as well. But now speaking of travel, that's not the only industry that has trouble with thermal expansion. The railroad suffers a pretty bad phenomena known as rail buckling. Even though metals don't expand as much as other materials, creating a very, very long line of continuous rail can lead to some bending. This phenomena alone has caused several hundreds of derailments. But over the years, we've been able to develop a better understanding and better technologies to help combat these problems. And so I popped a hole and then flame cut the rest of the tube off. I'll use a separate tubing to create the bottom and then attach both of them in the flame. 
When you start off on a new piece of glass that is at room temperature, it does take a moment to get it up to working temperature, which is right around the melting point. And so once you're up there, it only takes a few seconds in and out of the flame to do your work. And although it might take 10 or 15 seconds to get to working temperature inside the flame, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to get back to room temperature outside the flame. I'll do some wider bends for the bottom to give it a nice stable base. I'm going pretty slow, trying not to go too far past the melting point. I don't want the walls to collapse inward. Doing bends like these isn't too difficult. It does take a little bit of practice. I would recommend practicing on solid glass chain first. That should help with heat control and your coordination. It does take quite a bit of dexterity to make a full chain necklace. Why, if you practice and work hard enough, you may start to break the boundaries and limits that others set out, just like water and ice. Ice and water are two of the most notable rare exceptions. They have a property known as negative thermal expansion. For a brief range of temperature, they'll actually inverse the phenomena and begin to contract with heat or expand as it cools. And now the current explanation is a little complicated. As the water is cooling and contracts, it brings the molecules physically closer together. This causes the water to increase in density until four degrees Celsius, at which point the hydrogen in the water begins forming bonds with neighboring molecules. This creates a slightly empty hexagonal lattice of molecules called ice with enough intermolecular force to resist compression. And because of all of that phenomena, we have ice that floats, which is actually quite strange according to thermal expansion as colder objects become more dense and denser objects aren't as buoyant. And so for example, solid iron wouldn't flow on top of molten iron the solid piece would just sink to the bottom. And now I'll attach both sections together. I wanna to use a lot of heat on both ends and align it in the flame. It ended up a little bit off center. And so I'm gonna heat it back up and try to twist it about 15 degrees to the left. And now that I have both sections connected, I'll let it cool for just a moment and then come back to melt out the seam. I only want to heat one third of the seam at a time. The other two thirds will support the weight of the second tube, along with helping keep the walls from collapsing. I also need to give it a slight puff to move the glass around in order to even it out. I might have to go around more than once as well. And so I might heat and puff it out about six or nine times. But this should leave me with a very smooth channel. Ideally, it should look close to a normal tube, as if it wasn't connected at all. I'll make sure it can stand upright, and then I'll anneal it in the kiln for about a half an hour. And now as I reintroduce it into the flame, I hear a small crack. But I don't see a crack, so I only have to assume there's one there. And it most likely happened where the flame was last, here at the top. To be safe, I'll reheat most of the top ring again. So if there is a crack, it'll melt itself out. I just need to be careful not to overdo it and collapse the chamber. The other open tube is at working temperature since it was in the kiln. And so I can't blow into it or I'd burn my lips. There's a special Italian tool called the Sofieta. 
You can make your own glass version by pulling out a smaller tube to fit into the larger tube to puff into. And now after this, I'll put it in the kiln for two hours at 1050 Fahrenheit, and then it'll drop at a very slow temperature, about six or seven hours until it gets near room temperature. If it cools too quickly, then it could crack as the outside layers are wanting to contract around the inside. And now it's time again, my friends, to find out what happens. And so my hypothesis would be the inner tube is going to lower and the outer tube will rise. Oh, and there it goes. It seems to be reacting like I guessed. It's good to hypothesize before running an experiment. It's always okay to be wrong. That's just a learning lesson. And this is in real time. I haven't sped up the footage yet. I've also noticed some moisture building on the upper chamber. It's too bad we can't see the air, but we can see the liquid getting pushed down pretty quickly too. And so we could use this to test different thermal expansions of different gases. And now that we've reached the one minute mark, I'm gonna go ahead and speed up the video. Oh, and it looks like it might overflow. And now as I blow out the candle, we'll see if the air will compress, sucking the liquid back in. Oh, look at that. I think it's going up the tube. The air is compressing and sucking the liquid up. Very cool. And now we've reached the end of Thermo Expando. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, but don't forget... Do one thing for me, please. Pick your favorite episode and share it so they know where to subscribe for the Matt Yasa Show.